welcome to the Bridge to You podcast, hosted by yours truly, Monique Russell, where we focus on promoting Black unity worldwide through conversations that help us understand ourselves and each other. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Bridge to You podcast. I am your host, Monique Russell. And today, in my guest chair, I have the amazing, the incredible Nikki Bear. Nikki is what I call a total disruptor of things. I mean, she's an inspiration to millions of Africans looking to move away from traditional means of earning a living by disrupting themselves. And she is someone who truly avoids the status quo. She's the author of Be Disrupted in the Era of Emerging Technologies and Economic Anxiety. Her no-nonsense response is going to be something that you truly enjoy. I can't wait to dive in. Welcome to the show, Nikki. Thank you so much, Monique. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It is an incredible time right now. I am just looking forward to our chat. So Nikki, I always like to ask my guests, I start off with the question around, where would you want to be? If you could be anywhere in the world, where would you want to be and why? Right here in Africa. (laughs) (laughs) I am in love with my continent. Yes, right here. Yes. So what country would you be in or where would you choose? I would probably be in Rwanda. And why? Kigali, Rwanda. I love Rwanda, the the sense of security and safety and innovation that is happening in Rwanda just makes me, you know, feel wonderful and amazing. I was actually there in uh, February, just before the world went on lockdown, and I didn't want to come back to South Africa, you know, so Rwanda would be the country. (laughs) It is so amazing that you would say that because we actually had um, Wode Maya, who is a Ghanaian YouTuber. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he was on the show and he said that Rwanda would actually be his place as well. Absolutely. For some of the same reasons that you, that you shared. So thank you. Yeah, Rwanda is one of the safest countries, you know, in Africa and the cleanest as well in Africa. And I think about top five in the world, if I'm not mistaken. So, oh my God, it's a place to be. (laughs) I definitely can't wait to get there. That's definitely on my list. So now that you have said it, what did Maya say it? I definitely need to make sure it's a top priority. So Nikki, I know there was one, um, post on your social media that I saw and I I found it to be so inspiring and it said there is no bigger shame than being ashamed of yourself and I said wow this is actually really thought-provoking so I want to ask you if you could elaborate on that tell us a little bit more like what was in your journey that helped you create the definition of success for yourself you know, some of the things I write on social media, you know, it usually comes from some sort of experience I've had. It might even be a quote from someone else, but it will resonate with me at a very deep level. Um, prior to being who I am today and following my journey the way I, I do and trying to be my authentic self, I was in very much hiding of who I was. You know, I I was ashamed of my talent, probably so to say. I felt like I was in an environment where I could not fully be myself. I could not express who I was. I could not, you know, embrace my brilliance. I thought it would make so many people uncomfortable. And so I I shielded all of that. I just kind of moved away from my reality. And I've experienced so many ups and downs and failures and heartaches in my in my life. And prior to, I don't know if you've known my story, uh, my divorce. That was part of the shame, you know. I was like, even when I had become my, trying to become my authentic self, I felt like, oh my God, if people know she's divorced, they're not probably going to pay attention to her, you know. Like, who pays attention to a divorced woman, right? So it was that kind of, those kind of things that kept me from really feeling my, my brilliance and embracing who I was and giving my, my best to the world. And I remember one day telling my mom that I am going to talk about this whole idea of me being divorced on social media. And she was like, well, baby, if it makes you feel free and he'll 
go ahead and do it. It's your story. And I had to be very careful with the words I put together and out there and all of that. But I did it. And it was the best freedom I gave myself just telling my story and letting people know. Because as much as a lot of people were, oh, she's amazing. She's, um, she's so inspiring. As long as they didn't know that part of me, I felt like I was ashamed of who I was. And I, was, I thought that people would not embrace me or accept me knowing, oh, she's failed, she's divorced. You know, in Africa, I think women are raised to be nothing but a wife and a mom. And so when you've sort of attained that holy grail of success and it comes crumbling, you feel like it's the end of the world, you know, for, for lack of words, you feel like your life is over. So as much as I was stepping out into my greatness, that part of me kept pulling me back. And so that was the shame. I was like, you know what, I'm going to put it out there. Whoever accepts me, accepts. Whoever rejects me, rejects. But at least I will free myself from this shame I keep feeling, you know. So when I put that post out on, on LinkedIn, it was really, I didn't tell all of this behind the scenes story, but that was really, that was really my journey to embrace myself. And I'm trying to empower others. You know what, the biggest shame you're going to feel is that of yourself, you know. Mm, that is so incredible. I mean, you say so many things in this in this uh, response that I feel like, wow, I can go so many different ways here. Um, and and I know that especially like you talked about for African women, how we have been raised, how you've been um, conditioned to be either commoditized or commercialized or domesticated. Um, that has been that that sort of conditioning, but to be able to break out of it. I mean, you totally embody this aspect of disruption in so many other ways. And you said something really interesting when you told your mom that you were going to put this out and she said, whatever makes you feel complete, whatever would help you to begin that healing process. That's something really, really intriguing to me because I know that a lot of times women, they, especially of our parents' um, age, they don't want those types of things to be out in the streets. They don't want you to share yeah. that. So, <laughs> yeah. so tell me a little bit more about your, um, your beginnings with your mom. How did, how did she help to influence this courage that you have inside. Oh my you. God. She has been such a great support. And for full disclosure, she is not really my biological mom. My biological mom is of late. Mm -hmm. So, but she's someone that raised me from when I was, you know, 14, 15. And she took me in. And we are not even related to, to, to begin with, you know, but we I grew up in the same church where she was. And so she took me in after my mom passed, and I'm like, you know what? let's do this and since then I there's no other mom I know other than her you know and so even when my marriage fell apart she was the one person you know people throw stones at me the world throws stones at me she threw her arms around me and she told me I know who I've raised and so if you come to this I know there was no other way out so mm. she is some she's she's the best mom anyone could ever ask for Wow, this speaks so much to the to the importance of having people pour into us and helping us to see, even when we are at our lowest point, when we've gone through like so much uh, destruction or rejection or shame to have people around us who could help pull us out and disrupt us from being in that state of misery. And I know there was another um post that you had mentioned that I really wanted to touch on as well. And it was about connecting to this aspect of refusing to put up a wall. You know, this show is all about Bridge to You. It's about connecting Black cultures worldwide. You've gone to many different um, countries on the continent. And I see you put out information that really helps Black people to think about taking ownership and taking responsibility. But sometimes this type of betrayal or rejection or negative experiences amongst each other cause people to put this wall up. And for some reason, even though you've gone through so much, you still remain open. How did you develop this skill of remaining open? What are, what are some of the things that you do to keep that wall down between connecting with the Black cultures? Um, wow, well, quite an interesting question. I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> it looks like you have really been on my social media. Yeah, I prepare for all my guests. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I would say it, it wasn't something that happened overnight, believe you me. After my divorce, you know, when my marriage fell, I was like, I am done with men. Like, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, you know. But that was the pain talking, to be honest, you know. So when the pain had subsided, it was a whole journey that I went on in search of myself. Like consciously, I knew the pain was heavy and I knew that if I sit here for longer, I was not going to survive. You know, I could be alive, but I would literally be a walking dead person. So I went in search for myself. I went in search for how do women who have experienced this survive? You know, how do women who have experienced divorce at an early age, you know, survive? And one of the people like followed very closely her story was Sarah Jakes, the daughter of T.D. Jakes. So I intentionally picked her out because I know she had faced divorce in her life as well. And she eventually remarried. I just wanted to follow someone who had been through my similar situation and rules back up. So I started listening to her messages a lot. I was listening to the things she has to share about her journey. So that was the beginning of me, you know, finding my healing and letting down the walls of I'm done with men and that kind of language, you know, you, you don't speak like that, you know. So <laughs> eventually I, I started getting my healing from just seeing someone who had been in a similar situation like me rose back up more powerfully than ever. And I was like, yes, if she can do this, I can do this. Though we are on different paths and we're fulfilling different purposes, but she was one person that I listened to so much and it helped me see myself in her, you know? So that was the beginning of the journey. And I eventually started telling myself that I am not going to build walls. Everything in me wants to build a wall, but I will not build a wall. And I remember listening to T.D. Jax, the father, of course, and he said something during one of his messages that, was it even T.D. Jax? Maybe it's not him. I think it's someone else. I can't remember the name. The person said, this is probably not your last heartbreak. You're probably still going to get two or three. <laughs> I was like, wow, <laughs> this is the reality, right? So I make peace with that. I'm like, probably this is not the last one. And so if I'm still going to get maybe two or three before I'm finally okay, I'll need to let the, put those walls down. And so... It hasn't been an easy journey, believe you me, but the in, I'm intentional about keeping the walls down because if I take a brush and paint all men the same, the person to lose out is really me, no one else. You know, if I build the walls and hide myself behind them, the, the person to lose out is me, not, not anyone else. Because the same walls that keep the bad guys out will also keep the good ones out, like I put in that post. The same walls, you know, that will keep pain out also keeps, you know, growth out. It keeps opportunities out. It keeps blessings out. And I was like, why should I do that to myself? I am going to open up. I haven't seen anyone really die of heartbreak unless they willingly decided to do that. So I'm going to let this heartbreak as many times as it can before it to get strong. I need to teach it to allow this brokenness somehow you know to accept it embrace it and heal from it and learn from it and teach others to put the walls down mm, powerful so so many things came up there when you talked about like really watching sarah watching sarah's healing as a part of your own healing process that was really a powerful nugget and i want our listeners to really hear what you're dropping in the teaching here because even though you may have experienced betrayal. The other point is that it's never final. It's never over. Never. So you may never. think that, okay, you have a negative encounter with somebody and okay, that's it. It's, it's not going to happen again. But in this journey of life, as we're building bridges and connecting with others, your betrayal, your rejections, the trials and tribulations are never final. So you want to keep your wall down by intention, being really, really intentional. Because if you keep them up, you may try to protect yourself, but you're also missing opportunities. Now, Nikki, I know that you are like the uh, fourth industrial revolution guru, a mentor, guide, really helping people on the continent to think differently about their future. And I liken the parallels that we were talking about already today, because I think there's so many similarities just in your own personal story and in the aspect of really preparing for the future. So if you were to put on your artificial intelligence technologist hat, <laughs> and we're now in a room filled with people from different African countries who want to progress, but are feeling really as though well, my job gave me some trauma 
or I don't want to work with people from other countries because of xenophobia or feeling sort of some type of a betrayal or having these types of thoughts inside of themselves, what would be three pieces of advice that you would share from your experience on how to begin removing that wall and building that bridge? First, of course, would be you have to disrupt yourself or you get disrupted. <laughs> you know, there's no neutral ground. Like I've told my story so many times, I was in the corporate world and then I got laid off. And one thing just led to another, I was like, wow, eventually the book came out, you know, from just doing my research and trying to understood what was driving, you know, retrenchments and layoffs the way it was happening back then. Out of curiosity, then I tumbled upon a writer in me that I didn't know existed. I, I tumbled upon a speaker in me that I didn't know existed. So it's about people disrupting themselves, disrupting the status quo. Whatever life throws at you, sometimes it's not always easy to make sense of it, but at least try in trying to make sense of it all. You don't know what you can, you know, tumble on, which like I did. So the, the very first thing is to disrupt yourself, to start asking yourself the hard questions. Like the, if you are a student, the, the certificate you're currently pursuing in school, is it still going to be relevant by the time you graduate? Because the reality is that most of what students are studying today, they will never really use it in the real world. You know, So ask yourself those hard questions and find out specifically in your situation, will this be applicable in the real world? And if it's not gonna be applicable in the real world, then do something about it. Yeah. You know, the position you're currently occupying at work, is it still going to be relevant or be there in the next five to 10 years? For example, like accountants, are accountants still the thing? It will, will there still be the thing in the next 10 years? And if you know there's no future in accounting, then what are you doing there? You know, so those are the kind of questions that people need to start asking to be able to disrupt themselves, you know, mm -hmm. and I did a, I did a, a video recently, which I was speaking about betting on yourself. So that would be my second point on what to do, bet on yourself, because a lot of us are betting on people. A lot of us are betting on governments, betting on husbands, betting on wives, betting on uh, the economy, betting on friends. We hardly ever take a bet on ourselves. I'm going to do this. If I die, I die. Many have not come to that point. And so in this new era and the new normal and where the world is going, if we are going to experience some sort of a breakthrough and success, we need to start betting on ourselves first. You know, if help comes, good. If it doesn't, you bet on yourself, I'm going to do this. And I know I'm going to do this. I know I've got what it takes to do this. That is betting on yourself. You believe if, if someone comes through for me, good. If they respond to my emails, good. If they don't respond to my emails, I'm going to be just fine. If they respond to my phone call, good. If they don't, I'm going to be just fine. That's betting on yourself. You know, rather than sitting and waiting on someone or some savior to come and save you, there's no savior coming. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> no one is coming to save you so learn to bet on yourself you know and for me the, the third point would be to you know trust the process you know sometimes we want to figure out how this is all gonna end before we even step out no just step out and trust the process believe that the dots will connect at some point when I started I didn't even know what I was doing uh, everything seemed blink everything seemed pretty much seemed blink now for me sometimes even though I've made so much progress but just the process the dots will connect at some point great so you can hear your passion uh, strong Nikki why is this important to you like what is what is it about this mission that is so important to you it is about helping people find their voice. It took so much for me to find my own voice. It nearly killed me, actually, mm. to find my voice. And just, I love people to begin with. I am very passionate about people. So I want to see people be able to own their greatness, own their voice, put their message out there. Like uh, Maya Angelou, one, one of her quotes, she said, there's no worse agony than carrying an untold story inside you. I know exactly how that feels. So many people have stories inside them that are they are afraid to put it out there. They are afraid. Some people are afraid to even post anything on social media. I mean, that is how bad some people are in cages, you know. So I want people to be able to find their voice and own it, own their uniqueness, own their greatness. That is what the passion is all about. And especially for a continent like Africa, the narrative has always been that greatness is found in the west greener patches are found in the, in the in the european world and all of that 
I want to be the one that changes that narrative. I want to be in my own tiny little way. I want to be able to break that. That is why when you ask, where will I be? I'm like, right here, I'm right <laughs> here. You know, so I just want people to understand that Africa is actually the future, you know, and we as Africans, you know, we can change the narrative that Africa is a place for, for bad things and diseases and, and war and famine and all of that. We can show the world that we have greatness on the continent. We have talent on the continent. We have innovation on the continent. And if we don't start speaking up and having this conversation, how is the rest of the world ever going to know? You know, if I don't start owning up to my own voice, how is the rest of the world ever going to know? There is a naked bird in Africa. So that is really where the passion is about. Yes, I feel it. I love it. I'm in full alignment with everything that you're saying. Um, Africa is incredible. Africa is the future. And make, making sure that we are able to disrupt ourselves and share our stories is what's going to help others to find their own voice. The same way you were able to find and process that healing with Sarah Jakes, People are watching you, they're being inspired by you, they're being taught by you on how to now take their own uh, responsibility to disrupt themselves from the inside out and build that connection amongst each other. Nikki, there was something really interesting that I came across and, and before we start to wrap up, I will ask you about this experience because I think it's just incredible. It just speaks to how you embody disruption, not just in business, but in life. So. I understand that you have decided to go without a car for a few years. <laughs> what made you decide to do that? And tell me, how did you handle all of the stares, comments? Are you crazy? Like, what are you doing? I mean, after all, we're talking about the continent where these are status symbols that are, are very important. Tell me about it. Right here in Africa, you could be dying, you could go to bed hungry, you know, you could even be sleeping on somebody's backyard. But as long as you have a car, people immediately put you up there as the definition of success, all right? So I did have a car before when I was still in the corporate world, but when I lose my job, that was the first thing I saw, okay? And it hasn't really been the thing for me. I haven't really seen it as, you know, for me, I'm trying to achieve something much bigger than a car. Yeah. And so if it means the car should wait for now, let it wait. And for those that are uncomfortable on my behalf that I don't have a car, well, learn to deal with that because we are the reason why Uber exists. You know, people like me, imagine if everyone has to own a car, then Uber would not exist, you know, Lyft would not exist and all of the, the other uh, car sharing uh, companies. Anyway, that is just a fun fact, but the reality <laughs> is that I am chasing something much bigger than a car, you know, when I die and my, my corpse is being lowered in the grave. Nobody will care what car I was driving. It's about the impact I left in the world. It's about the lives I touched. It's about, you know, how someone was able to rise because of me. I don't think someone sees me driving past by and they're like, yeah, I'm going to make it. No, they don't know who they are, that person is or what they carry inside, you know. So for me, it's about really impacting people. I'm not trying to stretch myself beyond the limits I know I cannot reach, you know, or trying to uh, arrive at a place where I'm trying to show off things to impress people. No, for me, it's about inspiring people, not impressing people. And I haven't seen anyone denied a certain position or denied getting into certain rooms because they don't have a car. I haven't seen that happening. So the car for me is not what drives me. I am more concerned about, you know, what drives me from the inside. Of course, mm. I will get a car at some point, you know, but like I made it very clear in, in that in that video you saw, what drives you is more important than what you drive. But a lot of people in the world are being carried by what they drive. You know, some there are dead souls driving Ferraris mm. and there's literally nothing after they pack that up. But I want to be driven by something bigger than a car. Mm, incredible. I love that so much. And whoever wants to be uncomfortable on your behalf, then too bad. <laughs> So they there to you have it. <laughs> Nikki, you are the ultimate disruptor in everything you do. I love highlighting guests like you because you practice what you, you preach and you walk the talk. You are truly an inspiration. Just a couple of wrap-up points that we captured from your story. 
that whole aspect of shame, it is something that cripples so many of us as individuals, not just Black people. Just shame is something that cripples so many of us. But being able to come out of that shame, being able to share that story, looking at others who are where you are, who have gone through what you've gone through as a way to facilitate your own healing process and building that bridge is one of the techniques that you shared with us today. The other thing I wanted to point out is that your betrayal, your rejection, it's not final. If you think that you're going to put up a wall and then you're going to protect yourself for the rest of your life, you're on the wrong street because you will not only keep things in, but you will also keep out opportunities that are there for you. Nikki talked about the three things that we need to do to uncage our voice. First of all, there's no neutral ground. Number two, you need to bet on yourself. And number three, trust the process. I can't thank you enough for being on the show today. Um, I would want to ask you if our guests want to connect with you for any engagements or resources, where can they find you online? I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Awesome. Awesome. Google Nikki Verd. Google Nikki Verd. It will take you to all the different avenues. You can find me on my website as well. And my book is available on Amazon for those who are curious about it. So absolutely. I'll make sure I put all the links in the show notes. And there you have it, guys. Once again, another incredible episode of the Bridge to You podcast. Make sure that you subscribe, share it with your friends. Let us know. Let me and Nikki know how you enjoyed this. Send us a message on LinkedIn. And until next time, take care and be well. Thanks for listening to the Bridge to You podcast. Visit clairecommunicationsolutions.com or connect with me on LinkedIn, Monique Russell, or Instagram at Clear Communication Coach.